professor Moses Frankowski of Purdue University. Uh, I think he's been here already been a lot of advertised. And uh, you are uh, 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 Paul Rosen or something complicated yeah. the title. And uh, I also to mention he's from Purdue University and uh, this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the landing and uh, the moon. Uh, Neil Armstrong was uh, alumni of uh, Purdue University, the first man of the room, and uh, today we have the last man of the room. <laughs> 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 he just came back uh, last, last week and we will present uh, uh, structural and topical information related to his work about the Thank you, Philip. For the introduction. So, uh, Thank you for the invitation. What I would like to tell you a little bit today is about uh, the work that we are doing in the center, Center for Science and Information, particularly focusing on structural and temporal information. Uh, the Center for Science and Information is NSF uh, uh, Science and Technology Center. It's uh, 50 million seniors, uh, 12 universities, 200 students. University from East Coast, Princeton, MIT to West Coast, Berkeley, Stanford, Purdue, and Delhi, we have Hawaii, and so on. Well, what I will tell you first is a little bit what really we mean by science information and why, why maybe we need to do it. Then I will do a little bit of philosophizing about information. You will see what I mean by this. And then I go to technical part. Uh, and in particular, I want to describe you an algorithm that we call times temporal information maximally extracted from structure and dynamic graph. So this will be about dynamic graphs and two main issues, structural properties, how, what is the structural information and how you can actually find the best compression for this, and how you can extract temporal information from structure itself. You will see what I mean by this later. Okay, so what is size of information? The center is considered to be extension of shadow legacy beyond the original goals, which was mostly of impression and communication, as you know. Why? Because in, first of all, information cannot be left to information theory. That's my claim. Second, information is more than communicated and compared these days. It is organized, managed, processed, valued, uh, and secure, uh, uh, privacy is an issue, many, many other issues related to information. And I believe, and I still believe, we need broader understanding of information is. And to do it, we wanted to create intellectual uh, environment for people from very different areas, from chemists, biologists, life scientists, mathematicians, computer science, information theory, and so on, to work actually of issues related to information. And actually we have two orthogonal goals, at least in research. First we want to extend the information theory and I would say shallow spirit, and I explain what I mean by this soon, to uh, three, four different applications, life sciences of so biology, uh, data science, we call it knowledge extraction, communication, modern communication, and economy we make very little the impact in economy. And the second thing we notice, in order not to be too broad, that we have to better understand few aspects of information. Structural, temporal, spatial, semantic, in a dynamic environment, not point-to-point -point communication. It's a nice mathematical model, but it's mostly over. We have to deal with a much more complicated <coughs> So what I'm going to talk today is basically trying to combine structure, time, and dynamic in some application, including life sciences. OK, so this is how we, we broadly want to do it. Let me tell you what we tried uh, in the last five years. So the renewal was in 2015. And we came out with a triad under this banner we actually run it and we got extension from data to information to knowledge. And I would like to spend a few, uh, a few moments
trying to explain this words, actually not all of them. I think we all agree what data is. We would never agree what knowledge is. It's too complicated. In our case, actually, it's very simple inside decision or information action. I actually want to focus on information and try to have a definition that we all agree and to see what is the common denominator of all definition of information. It took me a lot of time and, and talking and fighting to actually dwell on the following, that information is a measure of distinguishability. I'm pretty sure we can have another half an hour or five hour discussion why, but I let you try to lay down my view and at some point I will show you something and I hope you agree. First of all, the word distinguishability is a very loaded word. For Shannon, it meant very simple thing. He wanted to distinguish signal from noise. In data science, we want to distinguish some learning information that we're interested in from the loss of data. The noise is different. But still, if you don't have distinguishability, you don't have information. Information is here only when you can distinguish certain objects. And let me, let me talk more about this. And by the way, within this framework, what we really want to do is to find the foundation. So, a few guys who actually uh, did uh, contribute to the fight soccer at few statements, he said that information only that which produces information, and it relativity and basically means that information, at least value of information, depends on the objectivity of the recipient. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Information only that which is understood, and Feynman actually explained it very well, well. He said, information is as much a property of your own knowledge as anything in the message. To give you an example, if you are waiting for uh, acceptable rejection of a paper that you just submitted, let's say to sell them, there will be a very long email, but the first three words of your message tell you everything. I'm pleased or I regret. You don't need to read anything else because of the prior knowledge. Actually, Paul Nard is a Nobel Prize winner biologist, and he said in 2009 in a paper of in Nature, he said that Biology is on a crossroad, and we have to understand flow of information. Not shallow information, some call it Darwin information, whatever that means, we still don't understand it. Uh, that the create, generate, special, and temporal order itself. Bill Bialik from Princeton, who is part of the center, he actually did a fantastic work on this one. Finally, let's me wrote uh, Frederick Brooks because that was the initial kick for me to start working on structured information. In 2003, he wrote the three-page paper at JCM. It was for 50th anniversary of computer science. And he basically said that Sheldon did a great job, but the great, greatest challenge this is still to understand information rather than structure. And he claimed that this is the biggest gap and so on. So let's see if we can do anything there. Okay, so I'm pretty sure you still have doubt whether the sequestrability is the main issue in, uh, in definition. Let me come back for a second here. I didn't say this. Uh, uh, Fonds I can say the information is not absolute. That is a very important thing. Uh, let's say if I ask you how much information is on this page. I'm pretty sure that many of you will get different answers and all of these answers are correct. Some of you will do some statistics of, uh, uh, let's say, letters. Some of you look, look at words. And I will look at the shape of words. Each of us will get, give you a different number, and each of them is the correct the definition of the information within the context. So take it in this one, uh, take it, this into your mind. So, in summary, I think every understanding of information has to have this flavor of relativity, objective, rationality, spatial, and so on. So we can have a very general definition. A piece of data carries information that can impact a restricted ability to achieve the objective of some activity within a given context. That's what we did it a long time ago, but it is too general. I like to defend my simple definition, information that measures distinguishability. 
And instead of trying to argue with you, I'm going to quote somebody. <laughs> Charles Bennett. Everybody knows him, by the way. He will be next week here in ISIT in Paris talking about quantum information. Here, what I find it six months ago, by the way. So information is really a very useful abstraction. It is this notion of distinguishability abstracted away from what we are distinguishing or from the career of information. I couldn't agree more. And actually, Komogorov also <coughs> pointed out, because information is always associated with probability, he said, no, it's actually more combinatorial. He said, information theory is even before probability. And uh, because in the essence, foundation is a combinatorial character, I, I agree. The reason that we have this confusion is because there are three, uh, three kinds of definition in common sense uh, when we discuss. One is in terms of the knowledge and logic. This is not the one that we have in mind. However, I believe logic is part of information. And next year, I'm planning to do a workshop actually in Krakow that combines computation, logic, and information. We are really in information type B when counting matters. Counting distinction, finding combinatorics, and C is not far away from them. So we are in this sense, and then this makes sense. You, of course, distinguishability is a very, very loaded word because you have to define distinguishing what. And, be, and in terms of this, you will have different understanding, remembering that there is no one absolute definition of information, but I believe the common denominator of all of them is distinguishable. Uh, before I ask for questions, let me finish the introduction before I go to the technical part. So with all of this into account, uh, we, I show you this trial data, from data to information to action, uh, or actionable information. And information is at the heart of this. So I would like to argue that a good fundamental work in data science should have at least two components, which is in general spirit exactly. The first component, the first clear question you ask is, how much learn learnable information is there? Well, that problem you have to solve. The first thing is, what is achievable? What you can do? In compression, you know, you can't compare more than entropy. I will give you other example than compression and see that the same question can be, what really I can learn from data? So you don't hit the head in the wall and try to get something that you cannot get. But this is the first question. So you find the limit, lower or upper bound. And the second part, which is kind of a converse theorem in information theory, you find a computational tools algorithm that achieve this limit. So universal compression is first you find, OK, because I don't know parameters, I have to pay for learning the parameters, and they tell you that you pay at least one cup of n for every parameter you learn, and then you find an algorithm that achieves it. But let's move beyond compression, but I will keep it, and I call it information efficient computation, in which we have this two phase approach. First, what you can do, what you can achieve, and second, how you can do it. And that will be my second part of the talk. Uh, we wrote the general nonsense that I just discussed in this paper. You can look at it. Uh, and this was basically our uh, view on this issue. OK, any questions to that part? Because then I'm going to go into more technical part that I illustrate on two examples. This two-phase approach. What is uh, the question, the fundamental question of learning the information and then computation of any question? OK, so I move. Let me formulate a problem now. So I'm interested in dynamic networks. This is a brain <laughs> network, functional brain network. And what happened is dynamic between, between evolution, because evolution over millions of years were any different functions. And these functions, that you have a correlated. When I walk, I have to breathe, but I don't need to talk. So there are certain parts that must be correlated. There. That's why you have connected a graph that connects different functions. 
And it is dynamic because certain functions are added and some disappear. It happened over a long, long period of time. Protein, protein network is similar. Certain proteins over a billion of revolution of years were added, some disappear, some are subtracted, and so on. One thing that I would like to point out, the topology, structure of this network and this are quite different. So there must be a different rules how new proteins are added and how new region here is added. I would like to find out what are the rules governing the dynamic process. I will show you one or two examples of it. This is artificially made dynamic natural Facebook. It's done very quickly. And here's the internet. Also dynamic natural nodes added and deleted. Okay, there are several interesting questions about this related to information, and I would like to address two. The first question would be, can I do inverse engineering from one snapshot? Can I reverse and can try to tell, tell you in which order not to add it? And second, what is the minimum number of bits to describe such a dynamic network? So these are the questions that I have. Let me start with motivation, and I start with the cartoon kind of motivation. Imagine a small town, let's say West Lafayette that Purdue, a, a, a virus came and people got infected. Uh, and what happened, they are going to the hospital, and the people in the hospital are trying to figure out when the infection started, so they connect people, they create a graph. And the one question that might figure out, actually, the people do not arrive in the order they get infected. Can they, from this graph, somehow infer who is the <coughs> starter or what group started this infection? This is not as silly as it looks like because there are many other problems, spreading of spam. When you see a snapshot and you want to do inverse engineering and try to see what is the source of it, uh, is spread of infection, financial transaction. It's also, you see certain, something at some time slot, but you want to go backward. And it turns out that the biological network actually unship all proteins are responsible for some it is, so it's good to know the evolution of proteins. So the problem is important. And here what I will tell you at the end, here's the example of what I will try to understand. So at the beginning, I have some data. Let's say I have fMRI data for brain, for a healthy man. From this, I will try to build a network of connection based on some statistics later explained. I will connect two nodes if I know that the correlation between them, based on the data that I have, is strong. I have this. This is what I see now. And I'm trying to answer the following question. From this, can I tell you that somehow give you some indication in which different regions in brain actually uh, evolution, how is it generated in children? Can I, can I answer this question. So this is the first fundamental question. Can I do it? Can I actually do inverse engineering? But that is not a good uh, formulation. So mathematical. So let me formulate it very precisely what I want to do. I have a graph of L nodes. So node number one is the first node. Node number two is the second node. And here, the way it is generated is a very simple way. When a new node arrives, I'm adding three edges, exactly three edges, to the existing nodes. I do it in such a way that I prefer to add nodes to those nodes that have higher degree. I don't do it uniform. So this is called preferential attachment with parameter n equals 3. This is my graph. This is the graph that I would like to understand. But that's not what I see. Actually, what happened, I only see a permutation of the structure stay the same. It is the same structure as this one. But I don't know in which order the nodes are added. So the best way to do it, I can say, OK, a bad guy, adversary, basically permuted all nodes. And that's what I see. So the question is the following. From this graph, when the structure is the right structure, unleveled graph, but the levels are not, can I find an inverse 
can I find an inverse a permutation? I think there is something missing here, but that's fine. So my job is to find an inverse permutation so I can recover this. The first question you want to ask, is it possible? Can I do it? Oh, uh, I would try to tell you that doesn't matter how smart you are, you can't do it. And so we have to actually think about it. Now, a few things. Why is it a difficult problem? Because for every pair of nodes, I have to tell you which node is first in this pair, which node is before the second. So I have to, for every pair, n choose two, n squared pairs, I have to have the right order. Okay? So that what we can, okay, so how we can formulate? I want to somehow, uh, I have a risk, mini risk, so what I want, I want to estimate the algorithm. I want the best algorithm for the worst possible permutation, adversary distribution, that minimizes some distortion. In my case, the distortion will probably be available. But you can define something else. Just, so if you want a more precise formulation, we have a tuple, a distribution of graphs, adversary distribution, distortion, and basically we try to find the best estimator, which is basically the picture you see, then the graph, permutation. So I see the permuted graph. Can I find the best permutation with high probability? So Shannon also asked, I want to recover signal with high probability. I want to recover with high probability permutation. Okay, before we can answer this question, we need to understand <coughs> a little bit some properties of the graph, which will be useful also for that second problem that I will do today. So first of all, graphs are symmetric sometimes. So look at this graph. If I permute B and C and D and E, I'm getting exactly the same level in the same adjacency matrix. It is the same graph. By graph, I mean level graph. So automorphism is a, is, a, is a form of symmetry, is a, a permutation preserving adjacency matrix, preserving edge perfect connectivity. So I can permute these five letters on five factorial in <coughs> many ways, but the level permutation gives me a different graph. Only five factorial divided by two. Two is the number of uh, symmetries in this graph. So the cardinality of this group is two. This will play an important role, especially cardinality of the automorphic group for random graph. We come back to this. Second thing, not every permutation is allowed in the model, of dynamic model that you have. Here is an example. So let me create again, on four nodes, uh, a, a graph, preferential attachment graph, with three nodes, three edges added every time a new node arrives. The node is the last node is number four. And it has three edges. Now let's permute two and four. Is it possible, if that's your model, it, can your model generate this? No, because this last node cannot have three plus one plus one, five edges. So not every permutation has a, a, a positive probability of being generated. So we need a new quantity, the number of possible permutations for a given model. Finally, now what I need to know is, the number of this thing relabeling, and I call it admissible relabeling, is basically the number of permutation, visible permutation, and it turns out that this is actually a ratio of all possible visible permutations divided by automorphic by symmetry, which makes sense. There are certain assumptions here, which I mention later. Actually, I'm assuming that every permutation is equally likely, but let's forget about this for a <coughs> second. So there are three quantities that I need. Automorphism, physical permutation, admissible. Right. Okay, now let me go back to the question that I asked before. So let's focus on this. I want 
on my uh, distortion method is probability of correct recovery to the right permutation. We can prove, using basically finite inequalities, that this risk is bounded from the below by this quantity or this, you see, automorphic here permutation. And you can see if this is a large, like, of order, let's say, n factorial, so if this is of order n log n, I basically will have that my risk, probability of error, is not far away from 1, which is not good, u on 0. Uh, let's, let's make it more clear. Let's consider two uh, models, okay? The uh, Erdos-Chenini model is very simple. It's not dynamic, but let's have it. So I choose two nodes, two, and I put an edge between them with priority p, okay? Every permutation is good. Uh, gamma is n factorial. By the way, I will tell you that it is known uh, that the, uh, on the random per, on the random Erdős-Chenini graph, the, the, the graph is asymmetric. The automorphic group is of type one with high probability. We know it for Erdős-Chenini. But preferential attachment is more interesting. Uh, so I have a parameter m. I pick up the first node and make m seven loops, and then at time t, here what I will do. At time t, a new node arrives and selects m uh, nodes to which it attaches an edge, but it selects this node not uniformly, but it depends on the degree of the node existing at time t minus 1. This is one why it's called preferential attachment. Is it clear? Is it a three distinct edge, edges at each step? I'm sorry? You create three distinct edges at if m is equal to 3, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. And also, just to understand, your goal uh, is not only to determine whether the graph could be uh, described by this building process, but also to find a kind of distribution. What is the probable, probable ordering to explain this graph? <laughs> there are many problems. My last slide list of them. Okay. But let's say one problem is I have a graph like this, no <coughs> levels. How many bits do you need to describe it? It's one problem. The second, I have a graph and I label it randomly. Can I actually try the proper order of level have it generated? That's are the two problems that I will consider today. By the way, in this graph, I'm not going to prove it, but the number of physical permutation I told you is not n factorial, but it's not far away because expected value of log is n log n, but the second term is not n, but n log log n. There is another model that I, uh, I will not discuss, but it's good to know it because it is counter example to some of the conjecture that we have. It is how we write papers, what we do with the papers, leave with the references. We copy from our previous paper, yes? Maybe changing one or two references. So in duplication diversion model, when a new node arrives, it selects randomly one node in existing nodes and copies all neighbors or partially. It means with probability P, it copies a neighbor or not. This is an interesting model <laughs> because certain thing that works for preferential attachment doesn't work here and it gives us a lot of trouble actually. Okay, so what is bad news about the problem that I for, uh, told you? And it's good to ask the question whether it, the solution is feasible or not. For Erdoshini and preferential attachment, probability of error is close to one. And actually the number <coughs> of incorrectly paired, and you guess it's n squared, and a number of pairs that you want to square them is n squared. So it really you're making a fraction of all possible pairs incorrectly. And <coughs> so, so uh, there is no good solution to this problem. <coughs> okay, we can do two things. We can give up research. Or we can try to reformulate a little bit and see whether in some practical application maybe a bet, a, the, another formulation is better. Maybe we don't need total order. But before we do it, we have to understand a little better structure of graphs. So I'm going to go first before coming back to this, <coughs> to the same problem, I will discuss now a structural compression of dynamic graph. What do I mean by this? Look, we have a level graph, but we have unlevel graph. 
I call it structure. And you can ask two questions. How many bits do you need to describe this structure plus level? How many bits you need to describe this structure? There are two entropies that would involve. Graph entropy, Hg, and structural entropy. I don't have any, okay. How you can derive it? So I will make certain assumption now, which is actually important. I will assume that every permutation of this level with the structure is equally likely. It holds for preferential attachment, you can prove it, but not for duplication model. Then, look, I consider joint entropy of graph and structure. Of course, structure is already involved in, in graphs, so this joint entropy is basically the standard entropy of the graph. But for this, I can write a conditional uh, the entropy like this. And now I have H here and this one. Now I have to compute this one. I told you, I assume that there is a uniform distribution of all of this thing reliably. So probability of G under S is uniform when it's basically the size of this admissible set that I just defined before, which is, by the way, what it is. Uh, so it is gamma automorphic here, and if you take log, you're going to get this. The important assumption was uniform distribution, uniform reliability. Uh, 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 so in order to compute, and I'm interested in the structural entropy, this is usually easy to compute. But I need to understand a run automorph for random degenerating graph and number of physical permutations. Okay, let's do it first as an exercise. Okay, you, that's what I just explained. Let's do an exercise at the Shreni. We started this research in 2012 with my student, Yonku Choi. <coughs> and it's very easy to compute it, by the way, for Erdoshini. Because for Erdoshini, this, what is Erdoshini? It's a matrix. Uh, symmetric, so n choose 2, and you put 1 with probability p. So you have n choose 2 uh, 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 random bi bi binomial random variables with probability p, so entropy is hp. So this part is nothing else than this. Now, uh, this we know is basically n factorial. We, I told you that automorphism is basically 1, so this is 0. That's why you have this quantity, n choose to hp, and n log n and some other. Now, I want, but this is the simple part. Now, I want to find an algorithm that actually matches this up to the first two terms. The first term matches trivial. Lampard Z applied to a matrix. And choose the element. I can do it. Now, finding the second term is a little harder, and we have an algorithm that matches the first two. And I only describe it very briefly because I want to actually describe something more interesting than this. So you see, if this is the graph, and I want to uh, uh, compress structure, not levels, I need only these two sequences concatenated. How it is done? This is basically <coughs> the process that describes how it is done. Here what I do. I choose randomly one node, and I do store the number of neighbors. Not who are the neighbors. I'm talking about structure. Number of neighbors. I delete it and continue this process. Then I can prove that this algorithm, we call it structural zip, as zip, is actually achieved the two terms. And Matching the second term is a little bit of work. But this is not what I want to tell you. I want to tell you what happened if I have preferential attachment graph. And then I don't know much. I don't know whether it's symmetric or not. So I don't know what the automorphism is. Analysis is much more complicated. I even don't know how many physical permutations and so on. So let's first start with symmetry. 
So here I plotted, for example, number of symmetries and cardinality of the automorphic group when m is equal to 1. When m is equal to 1, you win the tree. And in this case, you have a lot of cherries like this. And this cherry, I can permute this too. And if this is the view of the whole graph, they have the same view of the graph. So I have a lot of permutation. Actually, the automorphic group is a more than that. Now, for this graph tells you that for n equals 3, 4, you have very <coughs> little as expected symmetry. The surprise for us was that for m equal 2, so let me go back here, you don't need to see it. For m equal 2, there is some symmetry. Not with probability 1, with positive probability, you have some structure like this, that when you transpose, if these two guys have the same view of the network, and they are somehow isolated, this will create some redundant uh, symmetry, small one. But n equal to the graph might be symmetric. So the question was, what happened with n equal 3? And for a long time, we didn't know. And we just published 2019 a random session algorithm with uh, Thomas Kuchak and uh, Abraham Magner, who, is, who was my uh, uh, former student, that actually the graph is asymmetric for m greater than equal to 3. It means with high probability, you have only identical symmetry. The proof is interesting. If you want to look at it, it is in, in our paper. I'd rather show you a little bit what you can do with this. By the way, I also you need to prove it. It's not a trivial proof. That the number of fitable permutations here expected of log is n log n. The second term is not O n, something like this. With this in mind, here what, uh, okay, I will show you this too. First of all, we, uh, nobody actually knew what is the entropy of preferential attention and graph. But it's not difficult to figure out at least the first term, because look, when a new node arrives, and n of them have to arrive, so there is n here, it has to choose m destination. Every destination calls me log n to describe it, and I have m of them. So n, n log n is the leading term in the entropy. Proving this part is hard, and I'm going to leave it. For now, we don't need it. Now, I claim that the structural entropy subtract 1 from n. Why? Because we have this formula here. OK, so h of the entropy is h g what I show you n and log n. And now it is minus uh, expected value of log gamma <coughs> minus probably expected value of log automorphism. OK? Of G. Now, this, the leading term is m times n times log n. This, I just proved you that it is asymmetric, so with high probability, the automorphic group is of, uh, of predictably 1. So this is basically small o of n. Even smaller, I don't care. But this is minus n log n, I just show you, plus something. So you see, when I subtract, I have n minus 1 and log n. This minus 1 comes from the fine that <coughs> we have extra term coming from a physical permutation. OK, so this answers the first question. What is the fundamental limit? Can, and the second question is harder. Can I find an algorithm that achieves this? And I want to show you one. OK, so this is a small demo. This is my graph, building a preferential attachment with m equals 3. And what I will do, I will replace this by a d-graph. So whenever a new node arrives, I and attach m edges. I make it these edges, I make it order edges, from a new node to all nodes. So you see, I have arrows. By the way, 
I can recover it, and I show you later from one snapshot. But let me show my head. Now I do DFL, depth per structure. So I go from one to two, to two I go to three, but on three I have to backtrack. That is the blue number, which is important. I backtrack, I go to four, I go to five, I go to six, I go to seven. Now I have to backtrack two. I go to A, backtrack one, and so on. So there are two numbers. The red numbers are the DFS number. Blue number is a backtrack number. How I store it? First of all, all the back number I create an empirical distribution. I have seven nodes with backtracking number zero, three with one, one with two. I do Hoffman coding to store it. And then I do the following thing. Okay, I do the second DFS. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna second time traverse the same node, but the following way. You see, when I traverse, I traverse through one edge, but there are two other edges in this case that I will store information on the destination. For, for this node, I will store one twice, so this is my destination. When I go to three, you see what happened? I, I came to three through this, but then my destination is two and four. Let's see what happened. See? So first, when I go to two, I store one, one, plus I'm storing back second number, zero. Then I go to four, but then I store destination two and four, binary number, but I also store the backtracking number. So this is my code. This is my code. That's how I store it. How much it costs? Now, remember, I need this, this m minus 1. You don't see it here. This m minus 1 is the compression. But because, you see, when I came here, I only store m minus 1 remaining destination. So I have m minus 1 I have n minus 1, each cost me log n, I have n of them, but I also have to store the backtracking number. And this is difficult to analyze, but definitely the entropy of this empirical distribution is not farther than the maximum of the backtracking number, which is upper bounded by the height of this dark, which actually took us a while to prove that it is a log n, so I can compress to the first two terms and the, uh, up to n log log n. And this actually works. So the, the, the second part of this two-phase approach is usually harder, because not only you have to come up with a good algorithm, you have to prove it optimal. OK? Any questions? Let me go back now, and this is the last part of the talk, to this problem that I couldn't solve. I couldn't give you the total order in which nodes arrive. But maybe we can do something. OK. So this is the graph. Uh, with, uh, with some permutation. So what I, OK, let's see it. What I'm going to do, uh, this is permutation of these nodes. What I'm going to do, I'm going to create some beans. And I want order between beans, but not within the bin. So I group nodes, and within the group, I'm not going to tell you whether one will before, be arrive before two or vice versa, but I'm telling you that one and two arrive before four and three. So this is partial order that I'm introducing. It is a special case of a partial order. Can we do it? OK, let me show you, uh, so, uh, let me show you an example. Here's a small graph, one, two, three, four. After permutation, I have something like this. I'm asking whether this partial order, four is before one, before two in this graph, is a good partial order. First of all, notice that I do not ask anything about three. So I'm asking of much smaller uh, pairs, in this case, three pairs instead of six pairs if I want to consider all of them. I call it density, three divided by six, because I only compare three out of six, <coughs> and my density is one half. Now look, four and one is 
the right order because this node arrived before this one. But four, uh, four, but four and two is not the right order, and one and two is not the right order. So out of three comparison, only one is in correct order. So my precision of this partial order is one third. In general, I have two quantities that I have to compare. I want to have as many as possible correctly guessed pairs out of all pairs between beans. It is between beans, within the beans, or, be the, or this partial order that I decided to compare, not all of them. But I can do a stupid thing, I can put everything in the bean, there is nothing to be happy about. I would like to distinguish as many as possible. So I want that the total number of pairs that I compare in partial orders as large as possible. It's a fraction of all possible pairs I choose to. I call it density. Forget about this one. OK. So here's my problem. I want to the, ask the following question. What is the best precision for a given density that can be achieved? This is the fundamental question that I'm asking, not the algorithmic one. OK, so this is the optimization that I'm going to do. I want to maximize precision, subject to density being actually a positive fraction epsilon of ancient still. The optimization is relatively simple. <coughs> I will introduce binary variable, and it is one when the order of node is correct. Now, the precision, you remember, I have to show you more here. The precision is basically the total number, average number of correctly guessed pair, and this is probability of correctly guessed pair, divided by the total pair, but this is exactly this one, subject to density, and a few other constraints. This is not non-linear non optimization, but you can reduce the linear one. The difficulty part is to compute this probability. It turns out that this is equivalent to understanding linear extension of partial order. It's something that it's p complete. There are several algorithms we use. We use actually a, a, a Monte Carlo simulation to get a good estimate for this. Because I would like to have a curve. It's like a distortion curve. What is precision versus density? And we actually got this curve. This is the best we can do. So we have a benchmark now, at least theoretical one. Now you have the second question, give me an algorithm. Maybe like this, that actually is close to this curve. Okay, the algorithm is actually complicated and we don't have full analysis, but we have experiments. So, okay, look at me on this part. So uh, this is my original graph, this is a permuted graph. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to uh, reduce it to a D graph. This figure is maybe like, not that interesting. OK, so this is the original graph. This is permuted graph. How am I getting this from, from this? So that's what I see. OK, let me explain on that. So what I'm what I going to do in this graph? M in this graph is 3. Let me show my number. <coughs> So first, I'm looking for all nodes that have the degree exactly 3. It will be 3, 6, 4, and 5. I delete this node and all the edges. I have a reduced graph. In this reduced graph, I'm looking for degrees of order 3, 7, 10, and 1. I delete this node and edges. Then I'm looking on the graph of uh, node degree 3, 11. Again and again. So let me show you. What I just described to you is a peeling algorithm with you. You peel, we peel it. Okay. Now, <coughs> I claim that here's my algorithm. What I'm going to do, I'm going to read this is the oldest, second oldest, third oldest, these are the youngest. This is my algorithm. How good is it? I have a theoretical curve. First, I have great news to you because we can prove a perfect pair 
it will be the pair that I can, with 100% assurance, deliver to you and say, you is older or younger than V. Let's say you is younger than V. It turns out that we can prove that in this diagram, if I have two nodes, that one, there is a direct path between them. So for example, six and three, but not six and four. If there is a direct path in this node, this guy is younger than this for sure. By the way, my algorithm is using something else. I'm reading all of them. So for example, I claim that uh, I don't know whether this is younger than this, but I still, with my peeling algorithm, will claim. So first, what I'm telling you, that if you consider all the standards, I can give you 100% assurance that this is correct. Here's the problem. The number of the descendants is much smaller than n squared, and I need to get n squared pair. The number we can prove... It's smaller than n squared, the order? Or the, the order, okay. So we can prove that the smaller of n squared, we know experimentally, but we cannot prove, and it is difficult because we ask many people, that the number of the descendants is one plus some constant. So, the density, if we do this, is close, close to zero. But our peeling algorithm, actually, so this is the one that I described to you, perfect uh, precision, small density, peeling algorithm that does more, actually it's pretty good. And we have some, so this is good. Okay. Okay, so. The last few slides, and we can go home. <laughs> okay, some experimental results. First of all, this this optimal curve and experiment actually are confirmed. We are actually pretty good in uh, reaching the circular curve. Actually, the algorithm is much more robust because what we prove is only for a graph in which n, the number of edges added, is fixed. But that's not how it happened in life. So <coughs> if I choose uniform number of uh, every new node that can, uh, arrives in this model, I choose 5 to 50 nodes that I want to connect uniformly. So uniform. There is a very complicated model, Cooper Freeze, that does many things. Actually, it has a distribution of how many nodes you add each time. They are pretty good compared to the theoretical care that we did for fixer. Okay? So this is good. Actually, we apply for real data, including index network, citation network, and a few others. Work quite well, not very well on protein-protein network. But here's what we did finally. We wanted to get something real, at least in, uh, for theoretician. So we took, uh, we got uh, uh, fMRI data for a uh, healthy brain. Uh, with a lot of hustle, we learned how to create a network of connections. So every, so you have to read it. I don't understand it well, but every uh, every region, region is a functional region, is described by uh, data, uh, and uh, there is a data series that come up with that that uh, characterizes this, and I do some uh, correlation between the data series to show whether two regions are really correlated or not. And in this correlation, this is a Pearson correlation greater than 0.8, we connected such a two non region. otherwise not. So we got a graph of connection. And then we apply our algorithm, and that's what we got. We get 15 beams, that's what we got. Now, how good it is. The verification, the hardest part. First of all, there is no grand truth. We can talk to biology that change their mind every second day. Uh, uh, but uh, there are some anecdotal evidence. For example, it is known that Corpus Colossus is considered to be the oldest part, which is in good plan. Something here is known to be, I think, this one, to be very young. 
So we get the few things right, but we don't know actually how to compare it. We try actually to get data for a mice, for a mouse, because uh, it should be some correlation that uh, the order in which uh, the mouse brain evolved should not be far away from us, but we couldn't. Unless somebody wanted to pay us or be a co-author or something. So we did something else. We both are here, by the way, so these are the beans that we probably get right. Okay, so what we did, we bought data for 300 or 400 healthy brains. And we apply our algorithm for a particular region, for example, auditory cortex. And we want to see for the 400 brains whether our algorithm will return the same rank. <coughs> this will be some evidence that maybe there is something there. And in fact, it's quite concentrated. So the, at least there is some consistency. That's all the evidence that we have. Okay, and then the last slide. I, I want to tell you that uh, there are several very interesting problems in the dynamic nature. First of all, preferential attachment is one of the simplest, uh, better understood. Duplication, we are working on that. There are many problems that we don't understand. But here are some questions that, uh, that you might want to consider. The first thing actually you want with the brain network, your first question would be, why do you think that preferential attention is a good model? It's a very good question, and I don't have an answer. But the answer is, we are doing something. We basically compare parameters of these two real data and and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the model and trying to see how good they are. We do it for protein-protein network and duplication model. So maybe we can formulate the theoretical question. In general, if I have a sequence of dynamic graphs, half it grows, and I have a theoretical model, can I put goodness of fit like we do with distribution? When I have a data coming, let's say, from normal or uniform distribution, or from unknown distribution, I can ask, is this unknown distribution close to normal or uniform by applying some goodness of fit? So we want to do the same here. The problem is, and I mentioned this to Francois, and actually with his knowledge he can actually help a lot, because this is actually trying to do goodness of fit on a Markov process of unbounded space, non-homogeneous, non-stationary. I don't know of any result of this sort. With Abram Magner, we have an algorithm. Uh, uh, we have a proposed, uh, we have some sort of result with this. Uh, it, in practice, probably it's too crude, but it is the first step. But this actually be good to know something. The second question, I already told you in first spatial temporal, so the order of node arrivals, we did, we have something. By the way, in the dynamic network, actually what might happen, you have an infection process going on. Can you actually analyze it? And this is an interesting problem for, for sparse, spam uh, 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 distribution or spread. That, uh, we are talking about trying to understand misinformation and we have some idea that the dynamic network might help. Minimum bit, we know it, but we don't know anything about the application divergence model because we don't understand it. We don't know if it's symmetric or not. We know that it's not symmetric for some target, but we don't know for which one. It's a difficult problem. And then we might try to understand forward evolution if we have a good model. The problem in practice, as I understand is, and I'm a very practical man, as you know, uh, uh, is that most of the real networks are not generated by one process, but they are a mixture. And actually, figuring out this mixture is a very difficult task, and it's a good problem. Okay? So I think that's it. These are my browser, and I'm Grano, my friend Abram, he is my former uh, student, and GC is with the Haram. He is he was here. Philip uh, sent us him, uh, and he is part of it. He is, uh, Abraham had a job, he's looking for a job. I'm not looking for a job. Thank you very much. <laughs>
half a copy uh, there is this um, uh, definition which was given by Borden and which uh, I don't care for graph entropy. Graph entropy. There is this definition which was given by uh, Charles Borden and uh, and his course of Caputo, which uh, and Venkat uses this yes. for the universal compression yes. of uh, unimodal graphs. How is your uh, the graph uh, uh, compression related to that? It's not much related. It is actually what they think is very interesting, but they have much more general models. Yeah. And so yes. it's true for any individual graph. Right? Uh, uh, we discussed this Venka, we don't see yet clear relation yet, but this is probably we have to look at, uh, again, I think their compression is a little different than ours. But just the entropy, so the entropy, definition of entropy, does it fit with the uh, Venka, uh, with the no. uh, Borden Capital I, I, uh, I, entropy uh, or not? Uh, 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 my, okay, I read it once, my understanding is not, I have to actually look at this more carefully and we we'll discuss it once we finish our paper yet, but we need to answer this question. We don't, I don't think, okay, uh, you are, I, know, I, I understand you, you are saying we are doing compression, so that might be a relation, yes, yes. Uh, the question is the compression, so what is the compression? I'm doing compression of structure, he's not doing compression of structure. Yeah, just, uh, just so he's part. doing something else, his point is much more general, and this more generality might introduce certain things that maybe if I saw this generated, this would have used what I have. Okay, but he's, uh, uh, we are, uh, I don't think he's doing dynamic model also. Yeah. But he has, he has this uh, thing that uh, compared to what, uh, uh, in the first paper where they introduced this entropy, so he had marks, and so perhaps these uh, things that you have, which represent an order of things, could be seen as that marks. Could be. And, uh, and there he's able to, to extend the formalism to uh, look at the entropy of the smart crash. Yes, yes. Uh, again, uh, I, I don't know the answer to this. We didn't look at it. And perhaps another question. <laughs> so, so Go ahead. For what type of graph dynamics would you expect to extend this approach? <coughs> right? so for what dynamic graph what? Yeah, I mean, you, you looked at the coefficient detachment and you alluded to another case, but I mean, what is the scope of things? Uh, to okay, by the way, this is a very good question because this you need to answer in order to do goodness of fit. Because you don't want to do it for one graph, you want to do it for a class. So notice that all of these graphs are Markov graph in the sense, and we define it in our paper precisely, in the sense that when new nodes arrive, its attachment, its link, depends only on the existing graph. So this is, so this is a class. We, we have to reduce this class to something more in order to get our result, because it's our inability to prove something. But this is the general class of the graph that you would like to have. Probably you need to narrow it a little bit to make some uh, reasonable theoretical prediction. But mark of graph in this sense. That is the more general, but probably too general. I think, by the way, Francois, the geometry that you are using, the geometry graph, uh, there are, in a sense, dynamic alignments here. So, uh, 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 are they uh, uh, Markov graph the way they are done? Yeah, okay. No, but uh, in your pinning algorithm, uh, you put uh, every root in the same uh, bit. And I was uh, wondering why. Because uh, maybe you have some roots that have occurred uh, in the middle of the time, but uh, by luck, uh, no, uh, no nodes uh, were appended uh, to them. I don't understand what you mean by root, so let's uh, okay. The blue nodes up here. Which one, blue node? Yes, this is what I call the root. So for example... Uh, so these are the nodes that have degree M. Yes, so I understand how you decompose uh, yes. the different layer. I agree with this. Okay. Uh, but for example, node 6 uh, is uh, connected to purple and green nodes. And so it could have been created at the same moment, say, uh, to uh, orange layer, for example. Yes. And so I do not understand why uh, you put uh, the node 6 in the, blue, uh, uh, in the blue bin instead of the orange one, for example. 
so you are creating a different algorithm right now, yes? You basically say, okay, this structure that has nothing to do in a sense with the algorithm later because this is determined by the structure. Blue nodes are all nodes that in this have degree three, precisely defined. I delete 6, 12, 11, and 10 from this, and all edges, yeah. and then, okay, now. Um, so the question is uh, not uh, on, the, uh, on the DAG uh, construction, it's yes. rather on the way you allocate uh, colors to these. Uh, that, that's a very good question. Uh, 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 okay, so we, so we have some other algorithm that I don't remember that works even better. So what in this algorithm we do, we know that the number of nodes of the group N is a lot, about O N. So we somehow want to distinguish that. And we use some kind of a, a, a heuristic that I don't remember. And you probably can use your heuristic. My question is, I would like to prove something, and I can't do anything. Proving, uh, uh, analyzing this peeling algorithm is very hard. That, so you can try many heuristic but at the end, your verification is experimental. And maybe Philip can prove something. Yeah. Just to go back, uh, to go on with uh, this, this discussion about uh, this uh, peeling algorithm, uh, maybe I, did, uh, I have just an eye view. I don't show sure. the deep inside. Don't worry. But what I think, what, what I, I mean is, maybe you, are, you can commute the, the order in the same bin, then you will have the same graph. Am I right? Or, uh, uh, is it related to the computation of time uh, of our world? Uh, so, so the order probably doesn't matter here. Uh, however, I can redraw it, but still, these edges will stay the way they are. Because they are coming from the edges that are here, so they cannot change. The permuting here doesn't matter, because I'm telling you, by the way, that I'm telling you that I do not know anything, I don't want to know anything about the order between these guys. This is what yeah, yeah, this okay. Is what but again, the, so what is important that this goes up to here, and this goes up to here, you can use this property to get another characteristic. But it's very difficult. So in order to make any problem, first of all, you have to understand how many guys are on each level. We have some proofs. We know that this duck is very, uh, very uh, flat. The height is very small. And we know that this number guys over here is O n. If we know even exactly it's m divided by m minus 2, I don't remember. Uh, but getting to the next, the problem is the following. What is the difficulty? When I do the peeling, the first peeling, the remaining graph is not preferential attachment. The, the, the one, it, it has some dependency. That's where the difficulty is to analyze it. That's not the recursion. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.